Thank you for choosing Access On Demand. Access believes in continuing education, and we create content to empower you to learn and grow anytime, anywhere. Let's get started. Hello. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Refresh Your Coding Knowledge with the ICD-10-CM Coding Updates. Today, I'll be speaking with Annette Mitten, Senior Clinical Coding Manager at Mac Legacy. Mac Legacy specializes in providing coding, expert consulting, education, and tools for home health and hospice organizations. Nanette has served in leadership roles for more than 20 years, including clinical, administrative, consulting, education, and agency startup and development. She currently provides day-to-day -day coding and quality support and serves as a consultant for quality audit and regulatory issues that arise due to the complex nature of coding. My name is Mike Carr and I serve as a senior product manager with Access, where I help design, develop, and launch the Access Training and Certification Program. I'm an OASIS-trained physical therapist and have experience developing analytics related to functional scoring, therapy thresholds, PDGM, and episode management. Access leads the industry in, with a complete suite of easy-to-use innovative technology solutions, empowering home health, home care, hospice, and palliative care solutions to grow business while improving care. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. Your phones have been muted, but during the webinar, you may submit questions through the question section in GoToWebinar. We will follow up with answers to those questions after the webinar. Within 48 hours of the conclusion of, of this webinar, the certificate for HCSD hours will be sent via email to those who have attended. Today's presentation slides are in the handout section of GoToWebinar, and the webinar recording will be available in a follow-up email for all who have registered. So welcome, Nanette, and uh, certainly very happy to have you uh, with us today and appreciate your time and, and willingness to share your expertise with us. So let's go ahead and, uh, and get started. Sounds great, Mike, thank you. And I appreciate the grace as I shooed the child out of the room from school. Um, so I appreciate your, um, your grace with that. So. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera off so it doesn't affect my bandwidth, and um, we'll get started here. We can all relate to the uh, challenges of, of working from home now. So um, before we start, uh, Nanette, kind of what sections um, do you think of the coding will most affect um, home care coding? I think we probably have coders of, of all varieties uh, with us potentially, but which one, which sections do you think will uh, impact the, the care at home coders? You know, that's a great question, Mike. I think the main question um, questions are going to come out of Chapter 5 for the mental, behavioral, and neurodevelopment disorders. Uh, and these are all of the dementia changes. There were actually 83 code changes out of that chapter. So it's definitely going to be a challenge. That certainly, certainly will be. Um, so are there other changes that you think the coders will need to be uh, ready to adapt to as we as we move forward in just a, a few short days? Yes, absolutely. There are a lot, and we're gonna talk about a lot of those today, but one of the things that comes to mind is, you know, just a, a minor thing is uh, now being able to have a code for that non-insulin injectable medication. So a diabetic could patient could now potentially need three Z codes added if they're on oral meds, insulin, or some type of injectable anti-diabetic non-insulin medication. So it gets um, very complicated. I think, I think you just summed up uh, coding in general that is very complicated. So appreciate everyone <laughs> uh, joining us and uh, certainly thank you for, for all you do for the uh, industry. And let's go ahead and, uh, and get started because we have a lot of, lot of ground to cover and, and lots of slides. So uh, take it away. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. And I appreciate everyone's attendance here. Uh, just to reiterate, as Mike said, if you have questions, we won't have time to take those today, but if you'll put them in the questions section, um, we will most definitely follow up in a timely manner to get those taken care of. So, <clears throat> all right, um, you'll notice our learning objectives are there. And so let's jump right in. They've added somewhere around 1,179 new ICD-10 codes that will become effective October 1st. Um, they revised 28, invalidated 288, and then they've re uh, changed the description reviews for 
42 of those codes, and we're going to talk about some of that. Um, in addition to that, there have been a lot of additions to the tabular and alpha index changes, over 200, um, and you'll see that as we're moving along. Just a brief statement about comorbidity adjustments. As we're coding, um, and for those of us who code a lot of Medicare PDGM clients, we have to consider the low and high comorbidity groups. Um, dependent on the final rule, we're expecting there to be 23 low comorbidity adjustments proposed. This is up from 20 in last year. And then we also expect to see 94 high comorbidity adjustment interactions proposed from 87. Now, um, we're going to today, um, I, I confess to Mike that I'm very much of a nerd and very um, try to be very organized in my approach. So we're going to run through the actual coding guideline changes, and then we're going to go chapter by chapter. Um, I will not read each slide, <clears throat> but we're going to cover um, some of the majority of things that um, might affect the home care coder or that are interesting um, and could potentially be something that you need to look for in that medical record. So one of the first changes we see um, in, and again, I'm going by sections. Um, if you'll look at um, the conventions, um, the etiology and manifestation, just a minor word change when you're looking at an example of that etiology manifestation convention, they changed it um, from in to with Parkinson's. Um, and so uh, just to give us a little clarification there. And then under the con conventions, um, there's a section on number 19 that says code assignment and clinical criteria. And so we know from this guideline that the code assignment is not based on clinical criteria used by the provider um, uh, for that to establish the diagnosis. Um, and so we know that we have to have that confirmation. And so if there is conflicting medical record documentation, we're to query the provider. We know that as coders, but they've added this to the convention. So I was glad to see that. Under the general coding guidelines, um, you know, there are certain things that we can code based on documentation by the patient provider that, that we have to have that um, legal accountability for establishing those diagnoses by that provider. But there's a few exceptions when the code assignment may be based on medical record documentation from the clinicians who are not the patient's provider. And so this would be the physician or other uh, qualified healthcare practitioner. Um, so in the context of this, the clinicians um, refer to healthcare professionals who were permitted um, to document in the official medical records. So in our case, if we had a nurse who was documenting certain things in the medical record, we could assign that code to the code set based on that clinician documentation that is not provider confirmed. So in this list, they added the under immunized, immunized status. So it's good to know that. There was a little confusion about that. So if the clinician documents that a patient is um, partially vaccinated or under immunized, then we could assign that code. In addition, they added just the wording of that um, under this documentation um, section here. Okay, let's talk about complications. Um, and I love that they've added um, anything in this section that's bolded is wording that has been added to um, the coding guidelines and those are um, affected in 2020. Um, to October 1st. So don't get that confused with the new uh, PDGM payment modifications that will be effective in January 1st of 2023. That can be really confusing. So what this basically is saying is that the documentation must support that the condition is clinically significant. It's not necessary for the provider to explicitly document the term complication. For example, if the condition alters the course of the surgery, um, as documented in the operative report, it would be appropriate to report a complication. So you have to use some common sense. Just because it doesn't say complication uh, doesn't mean that that does not exist. Particularly, I think about a patient with a wound back. 
And so we have to be very careful um, about that. Okay, another thing, um, we're gonna run through some chapter specific coding guidelines, and then we're gonna jump in and talk first about all of the dementia changes. I have a lot of slides on that um, section, but we're not gonna go through them individually, but I wanted you to have all of those as a reference. But we're gonna cover all the concepts, and again, you can put any questions in that question box um, that we'll address later. Okay. So this coding um, chapter guideline um, is talking about infectious diseases. And what it is saying is that there's basically an exception to the guideline. Um, they've added a little uh, number two that says selection and sequencing of HIV codes. Um, and it says an exception to this guideline is if the reason for admission is hemolytic uremic syndrome associated with HIV, we're gonna assign this D5931 code, infection-associated hemolytic uremic syndrome, followed by the D20. So, um, and again, remember, you have to be able to code the D20 based on um, your um, state regulations um, that allow um, that to be transmitted. Now, just a brief thing, we have a few more slides later on talking about this. Um, hemolytic uremic syndrome, but just to know, um, I, I'm a curious person. I always want to know what these things are. Um, so this is a rare but serious disease, and it affects the kidneys and the blood clotting function. Um, what happens are platelets get clogged in the kidneys. Um, usually this is because of some type of infection, um, and that clotting ends up destroying red blood cells, and that can cause renal failure and you have small vessel damage in the kidneys. Um, usually it's a result of a complication of some type of major infection such as E. coli. Um, and when you think about um, the pathophysiology of that HIV patient with chronic diarrhea and how some of those things are affected, you can see how that um, could potentially be a, a kind of a complication that hadn't been yet um, listed. Okay. Um, Chapter one, um, a little bit about HIV codes. They just updated and stated HIV-related illness um, or AIDS um, on that. Uh, they also updated um, this section under coding of sepsis and severe sepsis that this hemolytic uremic syndrome associated with sepsis that we just talked about, um, you're gonna assign that D5931 as the primary diagnosis first. Okay, regarding neoplasms, just some clarification. Um, they changed some of the wording to chiefly responsible, um, be chiefly responsible um, for the admission or encounter or treatment directed, um, and that the primary should be that first listed diagnosis. So just some updated in the wording there in that neoplasm chapter. Now, regarding sequencing of the uh, neoplasm codes, they did come and add this section regarding lymphoid tissues. So a lot of times when you have cancer that goes to the lymph nodes, you're gonna find multiple um, metastatic um, sections where that cancer is spread to the different lymph tissue. It's reminding us and saying, hey, when it's gone um, outside and into the solid organ sites that you don't need to code a secondary neoplasm of that organ, that you need to code the, um, the one that states extra nodal and solid organ site. So great reminder there. Okay, so under the chapter, um, the specific guideline for chapter four, endocrine, We've got diabetes and the use of insulin, oral hypoglycemics, and those injectable non-insulin drugs. <clears throat> so they've just updated that to include that we should also add this code. So anywhere that you're going to see um, diabetes, then you're going to this is going to apply. Um, obviously, not to type one diabetics, not our E10 category, but all the other di uh, types. It's going to apply. Okay, so chapter five, um, 
did a, a couple of updates, changing the wording from for to describing, um, and then adding that 0.91 on the behavioral um, health. And um, that's one of the uh, new codes that they've added that we'll talk about in a little bit that has to do with um, use in remission. Um, so we'll talk about that. Okay, so <clears throat> the major changes that we need to focus on are the fact that dementia is really classified um, and should be classified not just etiology, but also the severity. Um, and so we really didn't have any coding classifications to um, show that what that severity is. So it could be unspecified, mild, moderate, or severe. In addition to that, it's gonna be broken down, and we're gonna talk about this, into the different behavioral disturbances and what those are. Um, so it's really good to, to understand that. Um, if we don't have documentation about the severity, um, this is something that has to come from um, the approved provider, then we're gonna assign the code for the unspecified. And if for some reason the patient is at one level and progresses to a higher level, you're only gonna assign one code for that highest level of severity reported during the step. And we may not see a lot of that right now, but as we get further along, um, I remember when we changed the, I changed the codes for CHF and nobody had, um, rarely did you have the type of CHF. Well, now that that's caught on, we're seeing more and more <clears throat> and you get more specific documentation. And the same thing will happen with this. Um, I've added um, an update for chapter 15. I'm not gonna cover those. Um, something you want to review if your agency does OB um, nursing. Chapter 19 was updated. Um, and one of the interesting things I want to point out here is that documentation of a change in the patient's condition is not required to assign an underdosing code. In other words, there doesn't have to be a change. So if the physician states that the patient is taking less of a medication, um, or has stopped taking it, then that's going to be sufficient for the code assignment. Okay, let's get into the chapter specific guidelines. Now, remember, I said we're going to cover the dementia first uh, because I want to be sure we get through that. Um, lots of slides in here. We're not going to read every one, but you'll have a good um, standard, you can put all these in a notebook and you can refer back to them if you have any questions. Okay, so dementia, um, they're changing how we think about that. And they also, when you just hear the word dementia, they want us to think of that as major neurocognitive disorder. Um, it's usually due to some type of underlying disorder, such as um, cerebral vascular disease or Alzheimer's disease. But currently, as I stated before, the codes don't really give us an expansion of that, um, of the severity, nor do they fully identify what's called their BPSD. And so you may hear that terminology. It's referring to the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. Um, and obviously, we need both of those factors to manage that patient um, well. Okay. So when you're thinking about code assignment um, and you have like F0390, that O is going to be unspecified. I want you to think about A as being mild, B is moderate, and C is severe. And there's the specific de uh, definitions of that. Um, these were actually taken, there was a, um, a an advocacy group, including the American Academy of Neurology, um, Geriatric Society, um, and others that came together to really come up with this consensus on how to, how to um, fully extrapolate and, and define whether it's mild, moderate, or severe. As you can imagine, if you do hospice coding, you would expect you know, that you're going to be seeing documentation of severe dementia prior to them being admitted to hospice services. Um, again, it's going to be tricky to get that documentation. 
Okay. Um, I want you to <clears throat> think about and, and really highlight this slide. So the previous slide and this slide will kind of be the key to uh, basically decoding how you're going to um, code these behavioral disturbances, the type and severity of the dementia um, and that behavioral disturbance. So agitation is one one, and agitation is known as aberrant motor behavior, such as restlessness, rocking, pacing, or exit seeking. It can be verbal or physical abuse, such as profanity, shouting, threatening, anger, aggression, combativeness, or violence. And then there's other behavioral disturbances, and that's one eight, and this is the sleep disturbance, social disinhibition, or sexual disinhibition, or other behaviors that may not be noted here. Now, interestingly, and um, some of those uh, of us in the coding um, world have um, requests out to the coding clinic to please answer this question, because under the guidelines, they stated under point one eight to use an additional code to identify wandering. Yet, under agitation, there's exit seeking. So it would seem to make sense that exit seeking and wandering, that maybe that use additional code for wandering should have fallen under the agitation. At this point, it does not. So just be aware of that. So if you have an other behavioral disturbance, it's gonna be sleep, social disinhibition, sexual disinhibition, or wandering. Okay, psychotic disturbance is gonna be two, and this would be listed as hallucinations, paranoia, suspiciousness, or delusional state. Three is mood disturbance, which includes depression, apathy, or anhedonia. I'm really just um, not caring about anything. And then four would be the anxiety. So, in a sense, when you, and when you look at this, when you have um, documentation of dementia with anxiety, um, then you're gonna be coding that behavioral disturbance. It is possible that you will need more than one code to fully explain those behavioral disturbances. So be um, aware of that for sure. Okay. So I'm going to run through these slides. What I've tried to do is give you the codes that have changed. Okay. So um, what has changed are the vascular dementia and the dementia and other diseases classified elsewhere. And you will um, uh, want to pay special attention to that. So we've got, for an example, we've got vascular dementia. Um, and then we've got FO150. Okay. And they've updated it so it states unspecified severity, and we've got psychotic disturbance, mood disturbance, and anxiety. We've got that 511, 518, et cetera. And so as you move through and look at these codes, it's interesting to consider. Now, just a side note, um, this FO150, um, um, we know that does not, um, it, because it's a manifestation code, it can't be an epigenetic clinical grouping, but it does fall into the narrow four grouping. And if you combine that with a respiratory nine or a skin three or four, you'll get a high comorbidity adjustment. So again, pointing out, we've got vascular dementia. We've got um, severe, the psychotic disturbance would be five two, unspecified severity with mood unspecified severity with anxiety, okay? So then as we move through this whole process, you can see how this is gonna work. So we've got our unspecified codes regarding the severity, so we don't know the severity, and but we've got unknown severity, but we know the disturbances, and so those were those codes. So then you've got codes for mild, with our different disturbances, okay? And then you've got moderate with our different disturbances and severe with our different disturbances, okay? <clears throat> so then we're gonna get over to the um, 
dementia, and other diseases classified elsewhere. What we don't have is a category for unspecified disturbances. So if we know the patient has behavioral disturbances, we're going to have to get clarification of what those are because we do not have a code for unspecified disturbances. So again, you've got dementia in other diseases. You've got mild. You've got moderate. You've got severe with all of our different behavioral disturbances. <clears throat> Also, you'll notice that under unspecified dementia, they've also listed major neurocognitive disorder not otherwise specified. And so that was um, added, and I want you to be aware of that. Okay, so we've got our unspecified dementia. So we still have a code for unspecified dementia, which in home care can be primary, but we know it cannot in hospice. And then we've got the moderate with our agitation, with other behavioral disturbances. And then we've got the severe. Okay, so I wanted to point this out, um, looking at all of these different um, categories. One of the things that's going to um, give us cause um, is thinking about, so um, there's another code that we've been given and it's mild neurocognitive disorder due to known physiological condition. Um, it's also known as mild neurocognitive impairment, okay? So for the first time, if you'll notice, um, it says code first, the underlying physiological condition. So it is possible that you could have a patient where the physician states mild neurocognitive disorder due to Alzheimer's, or they state mild cognitive disorder and they've got Alzheimer's disease. So rather than adding the dementia code after the Alzheimer's disease, we're gonna be adding this mild neurocognitive disorder. So it's gonna take us some time to take a deep breath and think through all of that as to how we're going to apply that in the real setting. I also added um, this slide because I think it helps um, to see where um, under Alzheimer's disease, under the category heading, it says it revised from code to identify is code if applicable to identify. So um, it's really interesting how this wording and, and we'll be watching for coding clinic updates as to um, how people are gonna interpret um, some of these things, for sure. Okay, well, I hope that that has been um, very informative to you. We spent a lot of our time on that. Um, we're gonna go through the rest of the chapter updates and just try to explain some of the things that you may see. Um, some of the things may not be common in home care, but when you do run across them, it's nice to know that there's a code available to use. The B37 category in chapter one under infectious and parasitic diseases has been updated to add specificities for um, candidiasis of the vulva and vagina. So we didn't have specific codes for those before, so those have been added. Now you'll see on this slide 55, and um, my apologies, there should be C61 malignant neoplasm of the prostate listed above here. Um, and so Basically, this chapter um, is just stating, used to, it would say, you have to code this uh, to identify, and it would give you whether the patient is hormone sensitivity status or a rising PSA, there would be a C19 or an R97 code. But instead of saying um, that, it says coded if applicable. So it may be not applicable, or we might not have that information. Um, so they're trying to update and clean up some of the wording of those things. Also in chapter two on neoplasm, they've updated um, several, you'll see several classifications where it's been updated from not classified 
to not elsewhere classified. Um, in other words, if you will remember what that NES stands for, it means it's, it can't be found anywhere else. And so that's a little more clear understanding of, of where to look and how to assign that code. Um, okay, so um, also the same thing on this slide is they were updating that to say, um, you know, revise it to not elsewhere classified for myelodysplastic disease. Um, and so rather than not classified. All right, there are a um, couple of um, things to add on this neoplasm chapter regarding neuroendocrine tumors. Um, and basically, they just came along and just said, okay, um, you need, we need to change the wording because we've expanded that N80.1 to um, additional codes. Um, and I didn't include all of these, but a lot of the changes that were made had to do with revising codes because of the expansion of that code set, if that makes sense. And the same thing here, because there's um, additional codes for endometrial cysts, and we'll see that um, here in just a little bit. Okay, regarding chapter three for um, hemolytic anemia, you'll see that um, we have added a lot of codes um, before. All we had uh, was this just D59.3 code. So they've expanded that, that we've got a hemolytic uremic syndrome unspecified, or we've got the heme infection associated hemolytic uremic syndrome, which we talked about earlier as related to HIV. And so that's just giving us, um, helping us to understand um, uh, where that falls in the categorization. Also, it gives you instruction to um, identify any associated infection. I remember I said E. coli is a common cause, uh, but also the pneumococcal pneumonia, among others. Okay, and I just wanted to show you the expansion of that category. Okay, let's talk about um, uh, um, von um, Villebron disease. And I know it's, it starts with a W, um, but it, it was actually um, named after a Finnish physician who uh, made some contributions to hematology. Um, and so it's actually pronounced um, von Villebron. So we did have a code for this, but now it's been expanded to multiple types. Um, I didn't include all of that, but I just wanted you to, to understand it's an actually a blood disorder in which the blood does not clot properly. Um, and so it's a hereditary defect in which this protein um, is deficient or defective that helps protect the walls of the red blood cells. Um, there's multiple other um, von uh, Villebron diseases and the subtypes have to do with uh, pathogenic mechanisms. So there's a type 2B, 2M, um, other required, and so there's multiple categories of that, but at least you'll have some semblance of understanding what type of disease process um, you might be coding um, and how that may affect that point of care for the clinician. Okay, um, uh, another update to chapter three um, is going to be expansion of this heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Remember, thrombocytopenia is low platelet count, which um, increases the risk of bleeding. So um, the word thrombos, um, thrombocytes, and we get the word um, from uh, the Greek word thrombos, which means lump or clump. So that always helps me kind of remember that. I feel like I can do a better job of coding if I understand a little bit about the disease processes that I'm looking at. So there are, um, there's a couple of different types um, that uh, the non-immune hit is usually pretty mild, um, kind of starts affecting the patient on day one. The type two is usually from day five to 14. Um, unless they've been previously, uh, because it's an immune response, if they've been exposed to heparin before and then are re-exposed, it could affect them quicker, um, but it is very severe and could be life-threatening. So they just expanded that category. And remember, every time they expand something, 
there's a certain percentage of these diseases that they've seen across the world um, to cause us to need to have additional code. Okay. Um, the other combined immunodeficiencies has been updated. And so um, this particular code set they um, up to, up updated to get a specific code um, for this. Um, it's called activated um, uh, phosphonosatide 3 kinase delta syndrome. So you may see APDS, but it's a, a rare primary immunodeficiency. Um, and there's genetic variants which are vital to the development and function of immune cells in the body. Um, interestingly enough, um, there's some linkage between um, patients who have this um, genetic um, uh, deficiency and breast cancers. So I thought that was kind of, kind of interesting. Um, it, it does tell us also to code if applicable certain manifestation. Um, obviously, with something that's going to affect your immune system, you may be more acute um, to certain infections. Okay, expanded codes for genetic um, stature, um, causes of short stature, not going to go through all of those. Um, very happy to report we now have some additional codes for acidosis. Um, these do not get us a comorbidity adjustment, but they do fall in the MMTA other clinical grouping. Um, so now, when before, we had no specific code as to whether it was acute or chronic or um, respiratory. Um, we can actually um, have a little better code um, to fully expand that. Okay. The musculoskeletal section, I'm sorry, the diseases of the nervous system section in chapter six um, has been expanded with um, several codes for limb girdle muscular dystrophy, and that's um, an inherited neuromuscular disease um, and has multiple variants or subtypes that basically causes progressive um, muscle disease. Um, and so there's multiple other types. So this is something we probably wouldn't see very often, but you would have to look for this specific. Uh, documentation, but it does fall into the primary neuro rehab. So if you were doing therapy because of that, it would be um, something that would provide you um, a fairly decent um, uh, HIPS code um, for you to be able to build. Okay, other diseases of the nervous system. Um, we now have a code for what's called POTS, and um, this is in the neuro rehab grouping as well. And so what this is an abnormal increase in the heart rate that occurs after sitting or standing. It can develop uh, suddenly after a viral illness or traumatic event or during or after pregnancy. Um, my suspicion is, is that um, they probably saw a lot of this after um, COVID. And so finally went ahead and, and um, you know, they haven't really said, but it would make sense that this would be related to COVID. Okay, speaking of um, some updates to chapter six, one of the things that is a, a great update is that we now have a specific code for chronic fatigue syndrome. You know, before we were stuck with using a code that didn't really fully fit um, that. And so particularly, um, the great thing is, is if you have a um, post-COVID syndrome and it's chronic fatigue syndrome related to COVID or post-COVID, then we have a code that doesn't fall into um, the R category that we can actually use prior um, to that U099. <laughs> okay, no updates for chapter seven or chapter eight. Um, several updates to the circulatory system. Um, and one of them is really adding refractory um, angina pectoris. And so um, if you've ever seen in the documentation where the physician states they've got chest pain that's refractory, the treatment, in other words, they're having a really hard time treating it or whatever they're doing is still um, an issue. Um, we actually have codes now to um, address that. Um, it, the, um, the refractory angina code um, is going to um, 
fall into the MMTA cardiac as well as um, all of the other diagnoses um, and then gives us a heart 10 comorbidity subgroup. Um, so that's um, good to have that. Okay, so there's a few things I wanted to point out. We have some uh, an expansion of the pericardial effusion um, category. And so we have the malignant pericardial effusion and disease classified elsewhere. Um, and then we also have this other pericardial effusion. Um, and um, chyloperiocardium is just where there's basically lymphatic fluid that leaks um, into that space around the heart rather than being of an infectious nature. All right, non-rheumatic mitral valve calcification. Um, so we have an expansion of this. Um, it's a growing problem in the elderly. The um, annula is the upper part of that, um, uh, that mitral valve and it calcifies and causes problems. So there wasn't a code to really identify and expand and understand that. Some expansion of our VTAC to specific types of ventricular tachycardia um, for SODs that points. That's probably not something we're going to be using in the home setting. Um, however, if it is seen, um, I want you to be aware that there's a code for that. Okay, moving on, um, I want you to see this change in chapter nine. Um, and really, it's just a change in the wording. So we don't have a new code for dysphagia. But if you'll notice, uh, this is I69.091 is dysphagia following non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. And so this, what I'm about to explain, would apply to any uh, dysphagia code, like dysphagia related to um, a CVA. Um, so anytime you would use that, um, you wouldn't have the need to use another code to identify the type of dysphagia. What they've done is they've revised it. Instead, you know, when you would code a CDA or in this case, a non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, dysphagia due to that, you would also add a code for the dysphagia. Well, in this case, the dysphagia, um, we're not gonna add that code anymore if it's unspecified. Um, because it really doesn't give us any more information. And so you only need to add the dysphagia code if um, you know the type. So, um, you know, oral pharyngeal or you have some specific information on that. Okay, moving on, there's a, a great expansion. And, and please know I didn't include every slide of every update. Um, we would have been here a whole lot longer, but there are a lot of updates to um, the aneurysm codes. And so um, there's a whole lot more choices for those. Um, we can now do abdominal, perirenal, um, just renal, um, uh, paravisceral. And so there, there's a whole lot of expansion of that. Um, so just want you to be uh, aware of that. The only ones that really um, are going to give us any points on these particular codes are related to the ones without rupture. They fall into the circulatory seven category on the comorbidity adjustment, and they will automatically give you a low. And when combined with a cerebral four diagnosis, they will give you um, a high comorbid update. Okay. <clears throat> So some updates to the circulatory system um, here. Um, just wanted you to be aware of that. Not something we're gonna see much documentation for as far as ANCA vasculitis, but just be aware it's there. Um, and then the respiratory system, just so that you know, um, the, one of the changes that they did is they've added a specific code for transfusion associated um, dyspnea or shortness of breath. Um, so that'll be interesting um, how that comes into play um, in our medical records now that we have that code. Chapter 11 gets us to um, a great code I'm excited about and they've expanded the hepatic um, uh, encephalopathy code. So we actually have a code for that 
and we're not relying on the hepatic failure code. Um, and so that was really important that we have that. So when we do see that documentation now, um, we have a specific code for that because you, physicians could potentially question. I said he had encephalopathy. I didn't say he had hepatic failure, um, but we had no choice because we had no other option to code that. All right, no updates to chapter 12. Chapter 13, um, a lot of updates um, to the um, lumbosacral intervertebral disc disorders. Um, specifically regarding um, uh, the annulus fibrosis defect. Um, and so that's been expanded. It wants, if, we, if we happen to have that specific documentation, then we would want to apply those codes. New codes for muscular wasting and atrophy when it's related to the cervical, thoracic, um, or lumbosacral areas. So we're glad to have those. Um, and then there's multiple new codes for clarification of a slipped femoral epiphysis. Um, and what they've done is they, instead of um, those codes, they've added stable, unstable, unspecified stability, acute on chronic, and then bilateral side. So again, um, sometimes we have that documentation, so we know that we have codes for that. Um, updated codes when um, there are fractures associated with CPR, um, specifically related to one rib um, with chest compression and resuscitation, um, flail chest, other fractures. So that's been expanded a little bit to give us some further codes. So nephropathy induced by other drugs has been expanded to whenever it's, um, so if somebody has a trouble with nephropathy because they got an um, IV dye because they were having a major, like a CT with contrast. Um, now we have uh, not a generic code, but we have a more specific code to uh, document that complication. There's now also codes, uh, particularly in um, diabetic patients that have uh, gangrene at the female um, areas that we didn't have before. And then we've got extensive expansion of that N80 category um, to capture more coding of the depth and location of endometriosis. Um, so an example would be superficial endometriosis of the right ovary. Again, that's not something um, we see a lot in home care, but um, just to be so that you're aware of that expansion. I didn't list the codes, um, but there's several codes in Chapter 15 looking at maternal care um, for um, fetal nervous system malformation or damage and other abnormalities. And then, um, if, like I said, if you do OB or a new baby nursing in your home care office, um, there is an expansion of the codes to more clearly define sleep apnea and other issues related to apnea in the newborn. Um, so it's really good to see that. We don't code a lot of congenital malformations, but there are updated codes related to congenital septal defects. So I wanted to be sure to mention that. Nothing in the symptom signs uh, and abnormal clinical and laboratory findings in Chapter 18. Chapter 19. So this has been expanded um, and applied to codes, including those for traumatic cerebral edema, diffuse traumatic, um, a lot of those brain injury, um, include, including codes for blast injury of the brain. And so basically, um, you know, we have additional codes um, for, um, to expand these and to look at um, you know, concussion with loss of consciousness, with brief loss of consciousness, um, and then um, concussion with loss of consciousness, um, status unknown. Um, and so that's kind of a game changer. Before, when we coded any type of head injury and we didn't know about loss of consciousness, we assumed that, that they had it. And so now a lot of these codes have been expanded 
um, and it, it states, you know, status unknown. We don't know that they have loss of consciousness, or if we do, we don't know how long. So we have a group of codes allowing us to address that. So we've got poisoning. Uh, chapter 19 is our injury, poisoning, and other consequences of external cause codes. Um, and then we have poisoning by adverse effect and underdosing. And so um, now we have a code to um, specifically for uh, methamphetamines. And so um, that's been expanded um, for that adverse effect and how to use those codes. So now, chapter 20, there were actually 477 codes for external cause of morbidity. Um, and so we have codes and these are like um, codes for motorcycle um, or uh, some type of motorized bicycle. Um, and so um, if there's injury related to that and we have the documentation, and then we may have a code for that. All right, other problems related to housing and economic circumstances. So we know that um, the factors influencing health or um, social determinants of health is something that we're all trying to um, do a better job of gathering information. And so there's been some expansion of that regarding um, other problems related to housing. And so they've just given us some other things to look at regarding transportation um, or financial insecurity. They've also, um, when you look at material hardship, um, it gives them some specific codes to look at um, for sure. And so it's good to have those codes. Because you know, the whole goal of coding is to tell that story. Obviously, we have to go by the rules and regulations. If you're following PDGM guidelines, you have to have a primary diagnosis that matches that uh, focus of care is identified on that face-to-face -face for the diagnoses that were addressed. Um, but it, we also know that we need to do a good job of creating that care plan um, across uh, disciplines and across um, the scenario and the, the continuity of care, whether the patient's in the hospital, home care, hospice, um, or other setting. All right, and under chapter 21, this is where you'll find the code for um, this uh, this new code um, for non-insulin. Oh, let me go back one. Let me explain this. So we have, um, we also have a new codes for um, immunomodulators and immunosuppressants, and they've listed those specifically. So it's something that we need to watch out for. If you'll pay attention under Z79620, it talks about monoclonal antibodies. Um, and of course, since the onset of COVID, we've heard a lot about that. And so um, for patients who may be on long-term use of those immunosuppressive drugs, um, that's something to consider. And then Z79.8 um, expanded and added that um, 8.5 code that um, they have injectable non-insulin anti-diabetic drugs. And those are usually the ones that are um, administered once a week or that type of thing. All right, there were no codes for special purposes under UOO to U85. Um, and that really um, ends uh, my part. I think Mike was going to wrap that up for us. And um, I actually got us out of, here, out of here on time. I know that was extremely rushed. Um, we're uh, very thankful from uh, Mac Legacy and um, from Access that um, you chose to spend your afternoon with us, and we hope this has been immensely helpful for you. Great job, uh, Nanette. I am uh, duly impressed that you were able to get through the, all that information uh, in that amount of time. It, it certainly uh, is a lot to absorb, and, and uh, very thankful again for you for putting all the slides together. I'm sure people will be uh, referencing those uh, often over the next uh, weeks and months as they get uh, their minds wrapped around all these these coding changes. So um, there were a few questions that uh, came in. I, I answered the easy ones. I left the uh, coding specific ones uh, for you. But again, we'll get back to, to folks in the 
very near future for those answers. So, um, great. Again, Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. No, uh, no problem at all. So, uh, again, uh, wonderful to have great partners um, working together like uh, Mac Legacy and Access. Uh, really a similar mindset, just trying to make the industry better. So, um, I appreciate uh, appreciate your time and and certainly thank all of you for joining. So just in closing, I um, want to again thank Nanette for sharing her uh, expertise and wisdom with us. Uh, don't forget, we'll email everyone a link to the slides and the video recording. And additionally, we'll send the HCD, HCSD certificate uh, via email within the next uh, 48 hours. So you've all uh, earned a, a HCSD a continuing education hour. Uh, that email will come from from Mac Legacy. So be uh, keep your eyes open for that. And thank you again for joining Access and Mac Legacy today for this webinar. We hope you found the content useful as you prepare for 2023. And uh, bye, everyone. Have a great uh, rest of your day. And thank you again. Thank you for joining our on-demand training today. Access is the only home healthcare technology company approved by the American Nurses Credentialing Center to offer continuing education credits and the most recommended home health software on software advice. You can watch more on-demand training videos through our industry-leading help center or at access.com where you'll find tutorials, blogs, white papers, and answers to frequently asked questions. Access, empowering care anytime, anywhere.